this is a Peralta News special report. Recently, evidence has surfaced that Richard Aoki may have been an FBI informant. In 2008, we interviewed Richard Aoki at length, and here is his story in his words. The struggle for freedom, justice, and equality transcends racial and ethnic barriers. Was he an FBI informant? Or a committed revolutionary? Here's Richard Aoki's story in his own words. This is a Peralta News special report. I'm Jeff Heyman. In 2008, Peralta TV produced an award-winning documentary on the origins of the Black Panther Party at Merritt College. As part of the documentary, we interviewed Richard Aoki, who was active with the Panthers at their formation. He later became an administrator, counselor, and teacher at the Peralta Community College District. Now, in light of the allegations that he may have worked with the FBI, we have decided to air Peralta TV's entire interview with Richard Aoki. Here's Richard Aoki's story in his own words. You might say I was a founding member of the Black Panther Party. I started out as a branch captain because I was the only member of the party at the University of California. I transferred from Merritt College to the University of California the month the party was founded. And it was Huey's idea to have a branch at UC Berkeley. And since I was the only student there, I was given the rank of branch captain. Um, Huey's father was a lay minister. And um, he urged me to be fruitful and multiply. So uh, I spent the next couple of years at Berkeley uh, as the branch captain there where I recruited a number of students to the Black Panther Party to the Berkeley chapter which was entirely underground because at that time any African American or any students at Berkeley who joined the Black Panther Party could be expelled from Berkeley. Um, those days uh, were marked by a uh, tremendous amount of political repression. And the university was no different than any other institution in this country about being anti-whatever it was that they didn't like. Um, during that period of time, at least two other Asian Americans joined the uh, party. I was born and raised in the Bay Area. I was born before World War II when the Empire of Japan and the Empire of the United States collided in the Pacific in 1941, uh, the Japanese population on the West Coast were interned in concentration camps throughout the country. We were no different than the others. My family was relocated to Topaz, Utah, um, to a concentration camp in the middle of the scenic Utah desert where it was 120 degrees in the shade in the summer and the snow drifts were six feet high in the winter. I was only about this high growing up there and we had no indoor plumbing so it was a bit of a challenge for me growing up. After spending about three and a half to four years in Topaz, um, I was brought back to the Bay Area to live with my father's family in West Oakland. West Oakland, uh, prior to World War II, was known as Little Yokohama because of the high concentration of people of Japanese ancestry living there. Um, most of them moved there from San Francisco after the earthquake of 1906. Uh, my grandfather 
came to the United States in 1902, both my grandparents were immigrants, but my parents were American-born citizens. Um, so after World, well, during World War II, with the depopulation of the Japanese, there was an increase of the African-American population in West Oakland. Uh, these were mostly Southern blacks who came to Oakland to work in the defense industries, the military installations. Um, even prior to World War II, there was a uh, significant African-American population in West Oakland as a result of the railroads. Oakland was the western terminus of the Transcontinental Railroad and the um, African-American Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters uh, was very strong in Oakland. In fact, C.L. Dellums, Ron Dellums' uncle and Ron himself lived in West Oakland. In fact, <laughs> I sort of knew the family offhand and met them after I moved to Oakland. In fact, Dellums and I crossed a few times over the last uh, 50 years or so um, in interesting ways. Um, and one has to recall that in 1945, uh, residential segregation was still the law of the land, so the West Oakland ghetto was a self-contained community. 7th Street in West Oakland was like whatever the main drag in Harlem is. And I recall growing up there and uh, having fun on 7th Street, going to places like Slim Jenkins, it was a nightclub, but I was a little kid, I'd just wander around at night. Esther's Orbit Room, which came later. The Lincoln Theater, the neighborhood theater that would play the movies after the Paramount and the Fox Oakland had shown them in downtown Oakland for the white people. We got to see the first run pictures after that. Um, I was homeschooled up until um, I was about 13 and then uh, went to Herbert Hoover Junior High School and um, attended that. Uh, graduated a year later, was valedictorian of my class, and um, was supposed to go to McClyman's High School, but uh, a funny thing happened on the first day of school. The principal of McClyman's had heard that my class out of Herbert Hoover was coming in the fall and made some sort of statement like, when the animals got to McClyman's from Herbert Hoover, he was going to put the animals in their cages. We had some reputation there as youngsters. So the first day of school, there was a big riot. The principal and vice principal were stomped. And it was alleged that there was an Oriental who was involved in the stomping. My mother, who had just gained custody of me, <laughs> made sure I didn't go back to McClyman's and got me into Berkeley High School because <laughs> she was living in Berkeley at the time. And the next thing I knew, I had relocated from West Oakland to South Berkeley, which is also kind of an African-American uh, neighborhood, but there was a significant class difference. The African-Americans in West Oakland were mostly new immigrants not as well educated as the Berkeley uh, African-American population. It has to do with migration and settlement uh, patterns. Uh, you, you often find this in uh, immigrants coming from overseas that settle in certain urban areas and then as assimilation, you know, acculturation, assimilation takes place, tend to move out to better neighborhoods and eventually to the suburbs. Anyway, growing up in West Oakland was one of the most significant experiences for me because I was immersed in African-American culture. I mean, <laughs> I was living there. Um, 
got to appreciate the music and the food, <laughs> yes. Ham hocks, lima beans, <laughs> black eyed peas, <laughs> smothered chicken, all that sort of stuff. And uh, <clears throat> I began to notice, not that I was analyzing the socioeconomic situation, that there was a great deal of similarity between the concentration camp experience and the racial uh, segregation in West Oakland at the time, but I didn't think that much of it. I hit Berkeley High School, which was at that time one of the top ten high schools in the whole country. Um, I even sat in a math class with the daughter of E. O. Lawrence, you know, the Nobel Prize. And, <clears throat> and I did notice that African Americans weren't in classes that I was in. Primarily because at that time in the 50s, Berkeley High had a tracking system. Um, generally speaking, white and Oriental students were in the college prep track, and African American students and lower class, working class, white students would be in the vocational education track. Well, um, while I was in high school, I decided I wanted to make a career in the military. I wanted to be a soldier. <laughs> and so I completed three years of high school and two and a half years. Several months before I was scheduled to graduate, um, the Soviet Union invaded um, Hungary. That was in October of 1956 and it looked like there was a war coming. And I figured at that time, if there's a war coming, they're going to need soldiers. And I wanted to be a soldier, so I went down to 16th and Clay, which was the military <laughs> induction center for <laughs> the East Bay, and said, I'm here to serve <laughs> our country. <laughs> and they said, well, we'll take you in. Um, your mother's going to have to sign for you. My mother was not enthralled about that. Um, and she insisted that they promise I would go into the medical corps because medics on the battlefield aren't supposed to get shot. You know, they're out there tending to the wounded. <laughs> Geneva Convention says you're not supposed to shoot at medics out there in the field. Well, <laughs> little did my mother know that <laughs> out there um, Army corpsmen, Navy corpsmen have one of the highest um, casualty rates of all the services. But in order for me to get in, I, I had to agree, <laughs> and the Army had to agree, that I would be in the medical corps from the get-go. Uh, but the recruiting sergeant said, once I'm in, I could do what I want. I could transfer to what I really wanted to do, the infantry. So um, they delayed my going on active duty basic training until I graduated from Berkeley High in January of 57. Three days after graduation, oh, um, my mother was also disappointed to find out that I was UC Berkeley eligible. 25% of the graduating class of Berkeley High during the 50s went directly to UC Berkeley. That's a reflection on the high academic standing of Berkeley High at the time. It's not that way today, but that's the way it was in the 50s. Three days after graduation, I was down at Fort Ord, California, <laughs> marching around carrying a rifle. Well, after I finished my basic training, I then went <clears throat> and uh, completed my medical training. I became a medical, surgical, and x-ray technician, thereby honoring my commitment to my mother. Then I quietly <laughs> asked for a transfer to the infantry, <laughs> which they granted. And they said, you're a good soldier. 
they thought it was odd because most Usually, the transfers requests go the other way from infantry to medical corps. Medics eat a lot better. They get a ration and a half per day because they didn't have to be real healthy to take care of the wounded. <laughs> and anybody that transferred from the medical corps to the infantry must have a, a problem. <laughs> I did. I wanted to be a career soldier. I was going to be the first Japanese-American general in the history of the United States Army and work my way up through the ranks. None of that West Point garbage for me, but being from a lower class family, I would probably wouldn't have made it to West Point because you have to have some sort of congressman write you a letter of recommendation and sponsor you. But I wasn't exactly enthralled about that because I didn't know any congressman. <laughs> We think that uh, this educational process is necessary and it's the people that will cause the revolution and it's the people that will cause the change in the country. Uh, the Black Panther Party is simply the vanguard of the revolution and we uh, plan to teach the people uh, the strategy and the necessary tools to liberate themselves. Truman desegregated the armed forces in 1948. Up to that time, uh, minorities served in segregated outfits. Uh, I could go back to the 442nd Regimental Combat Team that was Japanese American, the, the most highly decorated outfit in the history of the U.S. military, and they were my role models. Um, in fact, when I told other soldiers I was Japanese American, I got respect because all the the veterans could flash on World War II and the 442nd. I won't go into the illustrious history of the 442nd. The blacks were also segregated up until 1948. The, uh, we know about the Tuskegee Airmen. They were also kind of role models of mine because I was also a military historian-oriented type person. In fact, my strong Campbell interest inventory test that I later um, took when I was undergoing my psychometric training when I was at Merritt College, I took all the tests I was giving to students and took them myself just to see how valid these tests were. And on the strong Campbell, on the military part, I went off the scale. I went to my mentor. Dr. Harry Cochran, who was uh, employed at Merritt at the time, and he was a college psychometrist, and he said, I've never seen one this high before, Richard. So, and so I, I served a total of eight years active um, reserve and was in a few service training things. I went to the non commissioned officers academy down at Fort Ord. That's where I learned about medics. I was taking my sniper training and I was told, well, you're only going to get one shot off, Richard. You know, you got to be careful how you use it. So when you look over a group, anybody carrying a sidearm, field glasses, radio, pop them. If they're carrying a medic handbag, pop them. I raised my hand and I said, you know, I was told you're not supposed to shoot a medic and the Geneva Convention says the same thing. <laughs> Guy says, get wise, Richard, you know, wake up, smell the roses there. It was interesting. In the military, I enjoyed it. I was a good trooper. I was a happy camper. They let me play with every toy I ever wanted to. 45 semi-automatic, <laughs> M1 Garand, and I was an expert on that. Um, M1 Carbine, Thompson submachine gun, M3 grease gun, Browning automatic rifle, 30 caliber light machine gun. One time, they let me fire a quad 50, and that's four 50 caliber machine guns mounted on a half track. I almost had an orgasm, <laughs> the power of that. 
okay, boy, you're through now. You can let go. You're using up more ammo than any other recruit we've ever had. Um, but after seven years, I began to have uh, reservations about my military service because by that time, NAM had quietly started up. People think of JFK as a peace-loving president, but I was in the Army when he quietly activated the 5th and 10th Green Berets at Fort Bragg. And then the scuttlebutt around the barracks was, this is a good chance for a career move. So I volunteered. I said, oh boy, <laughs> Green Berets, I, hey, that's for me. And then I said, sign me up. And they said, well. You're not qualified. You you have to <laughs> you have to have this. You have to have that. And you don't have that and this yet. Come back in a couple more years, and we'll take you. I said, oh shoot. <laughs> but in a way, I'm kind of glad that I wasn't qualified at the time. Meanwhile, I began talking with buddies that were coming back from Vietnam in the early stages, who had been advisors, and they were telling me stories. I couldn't quite believe. They were talking about zippoing villages, you know, going into villages and burning the whole damn place down <laughs> and wiping out women and children. And this was years before me lie. And I said, wait a minute, that, <laughs> that doesn't sound kosher to me in the sense that I'm, a I'm planning to be a professional soldier and professional soldiers don't commit atrocities against civilians. And I can't be a party to that. Plus, my family from samurai stock in Japan, and that, that's not an honorable thing to do. Um, going mano a mano, hey, that's part of the game. But women and children, I don't play that. Even on the streets, I never played that. I was a young hoodlum in West Oakland and Berkeley, but um, those type of things weren't on my um, uh, table at the, at the time and never has been. So um, about the seventh year, I, I really started having moral reservations about the war in Vietnam. When you're in the military, you hear a lot of stuff and you find out a lot of stuff civilians don't know about. So I was a couple of years ahead of the American public regarding what was really going on in Vietnam. So at the end of my eight years, I went down the Oakland Army Terminal and was looking forward to getting my honorable discharge, which was all set and ready to go. And the regimental clerk uh, was there and had all the papers and I signed off and got my muster out pay, my travel pay and everything. And he had another set of papers, uh, enlistment papers for another eight years that the colonel had instructed him to prepare because once I got my discharge, I was supposed to sign up for another eight years. Eight plus eight is 16 plus four. 20 years, be a career soldier, military retirement, probably be a general at that time, yes. Anyway, um, I declined the enlistment or re-enlistment. Next thing I know, the clerk is calling the colonel, gets the colonel out of bed in the middle of the night and he comes down to the base and says, what's up? I say, well, we have a little problem here. Well, I don't think the clerk does. Richard's out, but he was not coming back in. So the colonel says, why not, Richard? I mean, you're one of the best we have. You're one of the 100,000 we got in the reserves now that are A1 material that we want to keep. So um, I kept getting nervous a little bit. I said, wait, I'm, I'm, I'm free. I'm free. The discharge means I'm a civilian again. He said, look, we're going to sweeten up the pot here. If you re-up, I'm prepared to offer you um, admission to OCS, Officer Candidate School at Fort Benning, Georgia, 
22 weeks, you'll be a second lieutenant because you're, you've been through the non-commissioned officers academy. Next thing is the commissioned officers school. Uh, and then, since you wanted to be in the Green Berets, we're going to put you into the 101st Airborne, the Screaming Eagle. You've always wanted that one, too. There was a time when I was young that I was willing to jump out of an airplane <laughs> with full combat gear <laughs> and a parachute. You know, I won't do it today, but then I was only, <laughs> I was young. <laughs> I was willing to do it. And he then threw in, I'm prepared to offer you $3,500 bonus cash for signing up again. Um, in the barracks, we referred to the reenlistment bonuses as blood money, making us professional soldier mercenaries. Um, we had a saying that uh, mercenaries kill for money. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to remember, mercenaries kill for money, saddest kill for pleasure, we kill for both. <laughs> you know, I said, wow. Shows you how indoctrinated one can become when one's young and exposed to all this um, negative stuff. Anyway, uh, I ended up declining the offer and walking out uh, a free man. Spent a weekend in San Francisco and blew my muster out pay, my travel pay, and any back pay. I had a wonderful time, what I can remember. The Barbary Coast, you know, old North Beach <laughs> was going at the time, and I had fun. Anyway, I said, well, what am I going to do now? You know, I'm out of the military. While I was in the reserves, I started taking classes at Merritt College. Uh, at night just to see what community college was like because it was only a couple blocks away from my mother's home and I was living with my mother uh, on and off and um, so I had to get a job. I went down to Alta Bates Hospital and uh, because of my medical training they hired me there as an orderly. They didn't pay me that much. I then went uh, to work driving a truck got a little better money. Uh, then uh, I lucked out and got a good union job in a factory. Uh, I was a quality control technician and Merritt College trained me. The company had a uh, deal with Merritt College where they would train the quality control uh, technicians in their factory uh, and uh, I applied for that and got it. And, making good money, had a good union job, and um, in the process I began running into um, socialists, communists, liberals, trade unionists, strong trade unionists. Many of them had um, been in the trade union movements. Many had been in uh, subversive organizations during the 30s and 40s. Uh, the 50s kind of wiped out uh, that group because of the red baiting and the blacklisting of um, potential subversives, etc. But they turned me on to Marx uh, and Engels. That's part one of our three-part interview with Richard Aoki. Conducted in 2008 as part of Peralta TV's documentary on the origins of the Black Panther Party. We'll be back next time with part two of our interview with Richard Aoki.